from Thames Polytechnic will be known as Miss X. Where were you living when the war broke out? In Eltham. Um, we understand that you were evacuated. Would you mind telling us a bit about that? Yes, I was only two and a half at the time and my father had gone to Dunkirk and his own family originally did come from Norfolk and so he insisted that mum and myself, my two sisters, went down to his family. After Dunkirk there was a, a big lull in the war and so we all, mum brought us there back. My elder sister then being, she's seven years older than me, then being nine, she was at school and the war broke up out furiously suddenly and on she rushed to school amongst the bombs dropping, picked my sister up, my sister Cathy and I were too young to go to school and she grabbed one suitcase and she put a few of each of our clothes in it and said, right, we're off. You promised Dad we would go to safety. So we marched down the road, Mum with us two toddlers, well, I was two, my sister was four, and this suitcase, to hoping to find a train that would take us to Liverpool Street. A lorry driver stopped and said, are you in trouble, lady, because there was lots of bombs dropping all the way around. And he gave us a lift to Liverpool Street. We arrived at Norfolk in the early hours of the morning in very deep snow. An uncle met us with a bike and it had a, a wicker basket on the front and a carrier and I was put on the carrier, my sister in the wicker basket and my older sister walked and that was five miles to my grandma's house in the middle of the night. Um, <coughs> do you want me to go on or do you want to ask different yes. questions? Um, we realised then we were going to be there for the duration of the war but the thing was, in the war, no one ever thought it was going to be five years. It was always going to be a few weeks. So after a few weeks, living at my grandma's, um, we had a telegram from Eltham, the council, to say that our house had been bombed. It didn't have a direct hit. It was next door but one. It was a landmine, but our house was gutted and was unsafe to come back to any rate. And we heard that furniture flew from the windows and mum's best dress was on the chimney. <laughs> so we decided there we must stay until dad came home from the war. Someone had heard of a small cottage down a lane that had been condemned 20 years earlier and grandma went to see the landlord and yes we could rent it. So in we moved. It just had a small, well the first room, kitchen, living room, the next room was a living room and then a door in the corner, we all wondered what it was, but it was a wonky staircase that went up to one bedroom and an attic. So an uncle from London sent an open truck lorry down with the few things that we had saved, or they had saved for us from the bombing. And mum, Cathy and I all slept in one bed and my older sister slept in a small bed at the side. And there we stayed for the five years. The cottage didn't have any facilities. It had a loo at the end of a 200 foot garden which was a bucket with a wooden thing over it. I don't know if you've experienced them in the country. So at night everyone had to go to the loo before they went to bed. So we went down like Nelly the Elephant, Mum first, me hanging on her pinny, my sister onto me and my older sister onto that. And we, I mean it was ritual, we all went to the loo and then we all came back. If anyone wanted one wanted to pay a penny in the middle of the night, I'm afraid it was a bucket because no one was going to go 200 miles down. Our water was drawn from a, a well just outside the cottage door and in the winter we had this hairy bit of string. Why we, we ever know it never got a new bit of string, I don't know, but all this, this hairy bit of string that when it plunged into the cold water and mum used to wind it up, we'd all be waiting for a cup of tea and a wash. The string used to not very, very tightly, and we all try in turn to undo this damn knot, which would never undo, because all this hairy string made it lock. Once we got the water, of course, the first thing was a cup of tea in a tin kettle on a hob on an open fire, which Mum had then had to light, and then the wash, um, which was always in a one of those white bowls with the blue, the navy blue line around the outside <coughs> on the living room table and everyone had a wash like that but Friday nights was bath night um, and then we put all the saucepans on as well. Obviously we had to all share water, we booked all the evening to do enough saucepans 
to fill this sink bath. But as I say, we managed like this for five years and then um, all of us went to school. It was about two miles away. Obviously, we walked everywhere. The snow in Norfolk, being a flat county, drifted a lot. So we used to hope you could just see the top of the hedge to find your way to school because the snow was so deep. And most of the time it was all right, but if you did waver a little bit, you went into a drift. And I'll always remember the snow down my boots, and then it made a very sore mark where the snow had got down your boots, and you all day long you sat like it. The children didn't accept us at first. We spoke with a London accent, and we were laughed at in the playground at first, and we were called Cockney Pallets. Um, someone who would cheat to say we were refugees rather than evacuees anyway, which didn't go down very well. Um, my elder sister at the time then had to, still by law, although things were so bad in London, still take, it wasn't called the 11 plus then, it's called the scholarship then, you know. Um, and she was elected to go to Eltham Hill School, which in those days was a, a <coughs> grammar school, in, you know, the school in Eltham. But that had evacuated to Wales. And mum had promised Dad whatever happened in the war, he was to take care of himself and she would take care of us three and we would stick together through thick and thin. So they elected that um, my older sister should go to a school at North Walsham, which was five miles away, and a school bus did come every day and pick her up. It was the school that Nelson went to and they wore the same shape hat as Nelson. And I remember, the thing I always remember of going with Mum to get the uniform, I remember it clearly. Um, the headmistress insisted on uniform, which you couldn't get because the coupons any rate, but she did insist on black shoes, lace up. But everyone had to have house shoes, which was such an extravagance in those days. Um, and I do remember Mum being so proud when Nell got her school uniform and we all stood at the bus stop to see her off and a dog called Scamp came and jumped up and made mud all over this new uniform. <laughs> um, but Cathy and I stayed at the junior school there and I thoroughly enjoyed it, except things like I thought we were picked on. And we used to have a, a small bottle of milk which she'd warm, the teacher would warm round a coal fire and it always caused the skin and I hated the skin so I used to flick it off with my finger and I got caught and so I was given a good smack. So my sister, who's always protected me anyway, the sister, two years older than me, please don't hit my sister. If you're going to hit anyone, hit me, <laughs> to the teacher. But um, food was short, of course. We were allowed um, one egg per week per person. Mum never had her egg because we always had Yorkshire pudding on Sundays. Um, but we always had one egg a week. And the sweet ration, of course. And then we used to get... Um, licorice all sorts and always cut them into four to make them last longer. Um, I think my worst memory of school was suddenly someone would say the van's arrived and we all knew what the van was. It was a van with a dentist in and then you all sat in your classroom waiting for your name to be called and to this day I will remember drawing a cup and saucer and making a blue line around the rim of this cup and saucer and they said I wasn't saying anyway. <laughs> Will you go to the dentist van? And I remember being so frightened. And there was a caravan and a dentist chair. And he immediately pour, pulled four teeth up without asking anybody. And I, all the time I was in Norfolk, my only dread was that he would ever, ever come back. Do you want me to go on? Or? <coughs> Did you ever manage to get letters from your father or news from your father from the front? Yes, quite regularly. I don't know if you remember, the men used to write the letters on a size, perhaps A4 paper, but by the time it got to us, it was reduced to about a third of the size. Um, the postman was a big, big thing in our life. We waited for him every morning. He came round on his bike, and Mum used to watch for a letter, and then we'd all wait while, he, while she read it. There was a lot of blue pencil across the letter. If Dad had put anything that might show where he was, or they regarded a secret, it was penciled out. But yes, and he ended every letter with love to... Um, it was kiss N, kiss K, kiss B. 
um, at the end of the letter, and Mum always left the, all these letters for us to see. Of course, I couldn't write at the time, but we all wrote back weekly, which was just like that, and Mum would put Reen at the end, and my other two sisters could write. Um, one day, we did get a photograph, and it was the big thing, and it was shown to everyone. It was shown to all the neighbours, everyone that came along, and every all our see could take it to school and show the teacher, and she had it on her desk for the day. And I was fingering it so much, and we didn't know where he was and whether he was safe. And I was fingering this photograph so much, I said to Mum, there's a word in sort of a roughness on the corner. And of course it was like embossed, and it said Cairo. And Mum was then asking everyone, where really is Cairo? Is there trouble at Cairo? I mean, we had the wireless on all the time. Um, I remember a lot of the wireless programmes. You can, We still say it now, as we walk through the doors and hold a door for a student. Perhaps a student will say after you and let us go through first. And everyone of my age always says after you Claude and the other one says no after you Cecil because <laughs> it was one of those jokes in the war on a wireless program and it comes so automatically that you still say these things no after you Claude, no after you Cecil. But my father was in the thick of it the whole of the time. He started off in the territorial army and they were the first to go and the last to come back. But it was amazing that no one was really interested in where Dad was. They didn't know there was a war on. They couldn't care that there was a war on. They grew their own food and they had their own eggs. <coughs> um, and they used to say, well, where is your husband? Mum used to say, oh, he's in the war. Well, bless is he what he doing there? Then he had a go. Why didn't he try to get out of it like we all did? And they did all get out of it. Well, they could. They were working on the land, you know. But we only knew one other person that had a relative in the war down there. And then between Dad's service, he was um, came home at one time to have 48 hours embarkation leave to go somewhere else. And he came down the school and asked, could we all come home? And everyone stared at him. He was only a sergeant, so it's three stripes, you know. But he looked like a general to them because they'd never seen a soldier. <laughs> and I do remember coming back to London. There was a lull on at the time. And so we came back to London for this three days embarkation leave and I remember lots of yanks on the train we'd never seen one we'd heard of them and my sister who was much more outgoing than me sang a song that Carl Miranda used to sing I, 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 I love you very much and all the yanks mm -hmm. gave her a thought bit each you know, and we <laughs> really thought that we were made um, when we came back to London anyone would put us up just for this three days you know. so we went to this auntie and of course there wasn't there was three of us mum and dad and they had five children anyway. And then we used to sleep bread and butter fashion for those three nights, which meant getting a double bed instead of two people sleeping in it. You slept five children that way, but no one cared. And I remember my father and Uncle Nat went out, and I said to Mum, well, where have they gone? She said, they've gone down the beer shop. The word pub wasn't used then. Well, not in our family, anyway. They've gone down the beer shop, so always they've gone for a pint. Um, and then we saw Dad off, and then we returned. But say so the amazing thing was, it was always going to be for a short while. This is why we made do, everyone made do. Um, Mum would have got a bike, she was old enough to, to ride a bike, and I could have been on the carrier, you know, because, say, starting off I was only two. Um, but we didn't. It was never going to be long, so we walked everywhere. Uh, just to sum up, could you tell us Basically, are your memories happy or sad of that time spent in Norfolk? Well, I think basically happy. Looking back, I realise how hard it must have been for Mum. I mean, when my husband goes out of an evening now and I, I'm left alone, I think, oh, you know, there's not much fun in this. How people did it for five years, looking after three youngsters and taking the total responsibility, I don't know. Um, no, we didn't want to come back. As soon as Dad was demobbed, he said, right, we'll come back to London. As you know, we were bombed out any rate. So they said, well, yes, we can find you a house on a council estate, just the other, in Lee, actually, rather than being in Eltham, until your house is rebuilt. So we all trundled along to Middle Park School, and by this time we had picked up a little bit of an accent. So as we had arrived in Norfolk, and the kids had said, oh, they're Cockney carrots. When we arrived back in London, it was don't talk to them, they're Norfolk dumplings. So we didn't win 
Um, we wore pixie hats and all the boys pulled them off. We weren't Londoners, we hadn't gone through the war with them and we were a bit of a social outcast. And we said to Mum, oh, please let us go back to Norfolk. And she said, I'd do anything to, I would do anything to go back to the peace and quiet. But make it more comfortable, obviously, than we'd, we needn't rough it anymore. Dad even did think of trying to buy the local pub at one time. And he was so unsettled, he even thought about going back into the army. He didn't, he stayed in the Terriers for 46 years in the end, but he never went back into the full service. No, I think on the whole, happy memories. I have been back, well, I still have relatives there. I could end with a funny story, it wasn't really the war, but I've told my husband about this so often. Before we had our own children, we went back and we stayed in a, a country pub for just two nights to show him the well and the school and the left and the garden and the walk to school and everything. And the Norfolk pe people behind the bar must have wondered why this young couple had come down. So in the end, their curiosity got the better of them. And they said, oh, Blas, why are you here? What, what, what you find around here that you like then? So I said, well, I was here in the war. So she said, well, Blas, girl, you don't look old enough to have been here in the war. So I said, oh, thank you very much. And I was ten feet tall. So she called her husband. She said, this young lady here in the war. So he said, were you, girl? Were you in the land army? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, just to say thank you very much for that interview. It was really, really useful, and I'm sure we all enjoyed it. Thanks, for, thanks very much. This is the second Avery Hill lecture with somebody with direct experience of the evacuation process during the Second World War. Um, can I ask, uh, where, where were you living during, during the war? Well, at the beginning of the war, I actually lived in the East End of London, mm -hmm. so we were among the first to be evacuated. We were evacuated on the Sunday, on the Friday, I beg your pardon. War broke out on the Sunday, mm. and all the schools in the East End were evacuated by the Sunday. So it was a very quick process, then? Well, it depends what you call quick. Um, we were actually taken to the station every day with all your cases. You went to school, mm -hmm. and um, for quite a few days you came home with all your stuff. And on the Friday we actually got away trains were available by the Friday. Mm. Your mum was quite fed up with you keep coming home. You know, you kept saying goodbye and you kept coming home. <laughs> and did some, did some people's mums refuse to send them? Or, 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 or want longer to think about it? Or did um, everybody's mums just send, mm -hmm. allow them to go? Um, my as far as I'm aware, and obviously I was, I was quite young, there were children who didn't come, but they were very much in the minority. Most, um, because you went as a school, I assume that parents saw it as a safer process than if you subsequently went as an individual child. Most of the children I was in the class with went with us. Okay. <laughs> What did you have in your suitcase as a child? Um, it, it, um, when suitcase is a euphemism because uh, in those days uh, people didn't have suitcases and especially people from the very poor parts of London. I mean people didn't go on holidays and things like that. So um, the government advised you what to provide and people were advised to use pillowcases and sew bands on them and then you put just a change of clothing. You're talking of a very different era when children didn't have the volume of clothes that they have today. I mean, the whole concept of changing your clothes every day wasn't the same, you know, that wasn't how it was done. So you didn't have a great number of provisions and um, you were given food at the school for the journey, so you, you weren't asked to take food. It was just this virtually a couple of changes of clothing, which for most of children of my background, that's all they had anyway. Okay. Which area of the uh, country did your school get sent to? We um, actually went to Somerset, um, very near Taunton, Wellington. Um, just as an anecdote, you might find it interesting. Most of us had never been on a train. We didn't really know much about it anyway. And as we drove, as we sort of got into the station, 
Wellington. They said, we're in New Zealand. You know, I mean, I can still hear this now, you know, and I thought, oh, I think that's a long way, you know. So, I mean, that was, we just, nobody knew where we were going. I mean, that was all part of security, I assume. Um, can I ask how old you are now? 59 now, it's a bit much, I mean, I'm telling everybody, um, but I was almost seven um, when, when the war broke out, yes. All right, and um, we're interested in what happened to the children that stayed behind. What, what kind of schooling was available, for example, if your whole school went all but ten kids, what did they do? I, I, really, um, I, I don't know, that's the short answer. I mean, the... I mean, obviously, when we got to where we were evacuated, um, there were no schools to take us. I mean, these vast numbers. So, um, but you took your teachers with you. So it was a premises problem rather than a, a manpower problem. How were you allocated to your new families? And where brothers and sisters kept together? Um, it was a, a cattle market allocation. And the pretty ones all went first. Oh, yeah. Mm. And um, we, um, I went, uh, there were four of us, two, bro two girls, two boys. Fortunately, I had a pretty sister, but it wasn't quite enough. We were left at the end. Uh, and because we wanted to stay together, obviously, four was a hell of a lot to place. And whilst they tried, nobody is going to take four kids on. So we were actually left to the end, and then somebody took the two boys. And we were then um, put in the car and taken round the t town and driven round and knocked at doors. And, you know, will you take these kids? And um, Sunday night we were actually allocated to a home. We, we got one. Um, we weren't really au okay fait enough to be upset and because the whole world was everything, one's whole world was so traumatic and it was just another, you didn't really think about it and you had a big bag of food, you know, what more do you want? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, did you keep in touch with your family and how did you keep in touch with your family? I was, um, as I said, the whole school went. Um, um, I was at a Catholic school with very strong family. You know, the ethos of it all is um, all there. So the teachers took it upon themselves to make sure that we all communicated with our families. And they helped people who couldn't. Fortunately, I could write. And so, uh, yes, I did. And... Um, we were very fortunate in that respect, but obviously there were children who never ever saw their parents again, quite a few. Can I just ask, were you, were you made to feel welcome in your new family environment, or were you, were you made to feel a bit of a burden? Was it an overall happy experience or not? It's a bit hard to um, say that. The house I went to was economically far superior to the one I had come from. I mean, it was just sheer luxury. I came from a big family in the East End of London, went to this very middle-class family. The only thing was there were no other children there, and I found that rather hard. But, no, my experience was a very pleasant one, a very overall, overall. Um, the only difficulty um, after a year, after um, I'm talking initially 39 then there was the horrendous raids on London and um, in late 40 my mother decided to move down with us my father was then in the forces <coughs> so she, um, I had elder brothers at work initially but they had gone into the forces so she then decided to move down and there was terrific resentment because I wanted to go and see my mum. It's all perfectly understandable. We went to a family with no children and then they didn't want you to go back to your own mum. Really? Yeah. So it's perfectly understandable, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 
So that's where the problem arose. So where did your own mum live? I mean, did, then did you go and li stay with her? <coughs> um, she was allocated a, a, a small house that had been requisitioned in the town. But no, we didn't go to live with her. Sufficient pressure was put because they were much more upmarket people that we went to live with and they wanted us. Well, not really, because there's ways around everything. You know, when you come out of school, where'd you go? Yeah. Yeah. So there's always ways around. So you went to see her every day? Every day, yeah. So you couldn't live there? Oh, no. Oh, no. You couldn't live there. Did that happen to a lot of people? Um, but their parents were, were able to move somewhere near, or their mothers were able to no, move somewhere nearby? No. Uh, n not a lot of people. Um, it, it would depend. I mean, one has to accept that there are an awful lot of people that thought it quite useful to get shot the kids. <laughs> you know? It, it, and you see, women then, you've got to think of this in the context of women's role. Before the war, they were totally housebound, totally subservient to the husband's needs and the kids' needs. All of a sudden, they became people. They earned money. They got, and they quite liked it. I probably would have done the same. Certainly not criticising them. But um, my m mother was the type that wanted to come down, but an awful lot didn't. You know, and a lot couldn't. They were in munitions. A lot of women were drafted into the munitions factories, so they couldn't have come. But my mother was older. I'm one of the younger children, so she was um, past the, that age at that time. See, we, we were under the impression that um, the government would have to do a, a lot of persuading the parents to, to give up their children and get them to go to the countryside. I mean, did, did the government have to do that? What about Hitler's persuasion of bombing you to? Well, sure, yeah. It's a balance. Yeah, so that, that was you the know, main, main thing right. that, that convinced the and I, Well, I think a big element was the gas in the First World mm. War. Oh. Everybody was afraid of gas. Oh, right, yeah. It wasn't really the bombing, because you didn't really know what bombing entailed. But mm -hmm. we all knew what gas, everybody knew what gas was. Mm -hmm. And everybody was terrified, as, as in the Gulf mm -hmm. War. Yeah. No different, is it? You can avoid a bomb, but you can't avoid gas, can you? You can dig a shelter. So I think yeah. that was the biggest... I, I, that's my opinion, I don't yeah. know whether it's so. Yeah, sure. And you, you were saying earlier that it was a bit of a, a cattle market, the way, the way the kids mm -hmm. were just... Mm. Um, shut down into the countryside. So there was there was no actual vetting of families that you went went to. It was, I wouldn't have thought it possible to vet mm. uh, if you if you went to a village, a t small town. It wasn't a village, a small town, and all of a sudden you need three hundred homes. Mm. How on earth can you vet? Yeah, you've got to have a roof. Yeah, you know. Ult there were people called billeting officers mm -hmm. that were. Um, theoretically supposed to then supervise and if they saw unsuitable situations then try and move mm. but at the initial stage you simply had to find them a home and one can identify with that I mean just got to get the kids in haven't you? Mm. Sure. Was there much preparation for the evacuation process? You said that you went during the first week of the war, but had it been talked about for some time before that, that if war should break out, the children would all go? I don't know that I can really answer that. I can only say what was told us at school. You know, we were told all what was going on, and my own family were, were very news-orientated, so I probably knew a bit more, possibly, than... The, it, it had been on the morgue. We spent our whole time listening to the radio because uh, there were all, as you know, all these peace moves and Chamberlain going backwards and forwards. And, but the school, in fact, did alert the families that if war came, that the children would have to be moved out. But one always has um, an optimism that it won't come to this. It's so bizarre, isn't it? Uh, it's hard to. But we, as a family, did prepare and did sort of think about what had to be done and who would go and who, because we didn't all go, you know, it was just the, the younger children. And then there was a baby, she didn't go, she stayed at home. My mother didn't let her go. 
Well, I'd just like to say thanks very much for all your help. It's Pleasure. been great. Yeah. Thanks.